Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kudrowski and this Organic Chemistry Lab video covers an unknown organic solution experiment. This is the video for period one, part B. In the previous video in the series, I introduced the experiment, I described the unknown solution you're going to be identifying, I talked about separating solute and solvent using distillation, and I talked about identifying the solvent using a combination of techniques. Now we're going to talk about how to start identifying the solute. This is going to be a much more challenging problem than identifying the solvent because there are many more possibilities for the solute and you don't know much about it. A good place to start is with solubility testing. The first thing you should do is test the solubility of your unknown solute in water and see if it dissolves. If your solute's soluble in water, it tells you you have a high polarity species, something that's very similar in polarity to water. If it's insoluble in water, you should move on to test the solubility of your solute in these other aqueous solutions. And we'll start by testing in 5% aqueous sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is a strong base. It has the ability to pull off protons on medium strength acids and on weak acids. If your solute is soluble in aqueous NaOH, it means it has an acidic functional group. It could either be a carboxylic acid or a phenol. If this is the case, you should test the solubility of your unknown solute in aqueous sodium bicarbonate, NaHCO3. This is a weak base, and it has the ability to deprotonate a medium strength acid like a carboxylic acid, but not a weaker acid like a phenol. If it's soluble in aqueous NaOH, it means that your compound is a carboxylic acid, which is a medium strength acid with a pKa value of about 5. If the compound was soluble in NaOH, the strong base, but insoluble in NaHCO3, the weak base, it means you have a weak acid. And that could be a phenol, which is a weaker acid that has a pKa of about 10. If your solute is insoluble in aqueous NaOH, it means you could have either an amine, an alcohol, an aldehyde, a ketone, or an ester. It means you have a functional group that doesn't have an acidic proton. The next thing to do then is to test the solubility of your solute in aqueous HCl. This is a strong acid. If it's soluble in the strong acid, it means you have a basic functional group present in your unknown solute. That would be an amine. This is a base that gets protonated by the acid. If it's insoluble in aqueous HCl, it means you have a neutral compound. This could be something like an alcohol, an aldehyde, a ketone, or an ester. On the subsequent slides, I'll explain why the different functional groups dissolve the way that they do. I'll start with the water solubility of neutral molecules. Many molecules have both polar and nonpolar portions, and the relative sizes of these parts determine the water solubility. For example, let's take the molecule 1-propanol. This is a molecule that has a polar part. Oxygen makes this portion of the molecule polar because it's more electronegative than carbon or hydrogen. And then there's a nonpolar part, which I'm highlighting here in light green. This is a part of the molecule that doesn't have significant dipoles. This molecule is very water soluble. It's soluble in water in all portions. The polar portion dominates the solubility characteristics of this molecule. Now let's take a look at a molecule that's one carbon longer. This is 1-butanol. It's one carbon longer than 1-propanol. It has the same polar part as 1-propanol, but it has a longer nonpolar part that contains more nonpolar atoms. This molecule is slightly water soluble. It's a little bit soluble in water, but it's a lot less soluble than 1-propanol because the nonpolar part, the part that doesn't like to associate with water, has become larger. If we take that a step further and look at 1-pentanol, here's a molecule that has the same polar part but has an even longer nonpolar part. This molecule overall is going to be a lot less polar because its nonpolar part is big. 1-pentanol is essentially water insoluble. So the molecule on the left is more water soluble because it's more polar overall, or as you move to the right, the molecule is less polar overall because its nonpolar portion has become larger and more important. This is the general case with all neutral molecules, not just alcohols. You have to look at the contribution of the polar portions of the molecule and the nonpolar portions and use that as a guide to decide what's the overall characteristic of the molecule. Is it more like water or is it less like water? Now I'm going to talk about the solubility of carboxylic acids. Carboxylic acids can be deprotonated by both weak bases like sodium bicarbonate or strong bases like sodium hydroxide to give a more polar and more water soluble salt. As an example, I'm going to use benzoic acid, which I've shown here. Benzoic acid has a polar part. The carboxyl group is polar. It has a lot of partial minus and partial positive charges on its various atoms. And then it has a nonpolar part, which I've highlighted here in green. And overall, it's water insoluble. If this molecule is put in with a base like sodium hydroxide or sodium bicarbonate, that base can deprotonate the carboxylic acid, and that generates a carboxylate salt. The salt is a lot more polar than the neutral species. There's a lot more charge separation associated with the salt. That means the contribution of the polar piece in this molecule is much larger, as I've tried to indicate here with the large blue circle. 
we've accentuated the polarity of this molecule by converting it into a salt, whereas the nonpolar part is still the same size, still has the same contribution. So because this salt is so much more polar and more water-like, it's overall much more water-soluble. You can take a carboxylate salt and protonate it to make it back into the neutral species, which then would be less water-soluble. Next, I'll talk about the water solubility of phenols. Phenols are weak acids, and they can be deprotonated by strong bases like sodium hydroxide, and that gives a more polar and more water-soluble salt. However, a weak base like sodium bicarbonate doesn't have enough base strength to deprotonate them, and that's why the solubility tests work the way that they do. Here's the molecule phenol. It has a polar part, an OH group, which has dipoles associated with it, and it also has a nonpolar part that's fairly large and dominates the solubility of this molecule. So this species is overall water insoluble. However, if it's put in with a strong base, sodium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide can deprotonate the proton on the O and generate something called a phenoxide salt. This salt is a lot more polar than the neutral species, as I've tried to indicate here by drawing a large blue circle around it to indicate that we've accentuated the polarity of this molecule by making it into a salt. And the nonpolar part remains the same size, so here we have a molecule that has a much higher polarity overall, and it is water-soluble. On this slide, I'll talk about the solubility of amines. Amines are bases, and they can be protonated by an acid like HCl to give a more polar and more water-soluble salt. Here's an example of a representative amine. This is aniline. Any amine with carbon groups would work in a similar way. This molecule has a polar part, the amine, has dipoles associated with it, and it's polar, it's water-like. And then the nonpolar part is highlighted here in light green. It's much larger than the polar part, and therefore this molecule is water-insoluble. However, if you put this molecule in with HCl, that's a strong acid, the nitrogen lone pair can grab the proton off of the HCl, protonating it to generate an ammonium salt. This species has a much larger polar portion, now being a salt, and it has the same size nonpolar part, which is now less important. This molecule is overall more polar and therefore more water soluble. So you can manipulate the solubility of organic molecules that have acidic or basic functional groups to change their solubility in water. Next, I'm going to talk about the mini boiling point test. Boiling point is a test that we'll need to do for unknown solute liquids. And this is one easy, pretty reliable way to get boiling points on liquids. Start off with a ring stand and a heating mantle, which has sand in it. And that gets plugged into a variable transformer that gets plugged into the 120 volt wall current. Next, you'll take a test tube and you'll put some of your unknown solute in it clamp it to the ring stand, and then place that test tube in the sand bath down until it makes contact with the bottom of the heating mantle. Put a boiling chip in that tube, and then clamp a thermometer to the ring stand such that the bulb is clamped just above the liquid surface in the test tube. The idea here is we're going to turn on the variable transformer and heat the liquid to a vigorous boil. And I've tried to indicate that with a few little bubbles here that I'm showing in the test tube. The thermometer bulb should be fully immersed in the hot sample vapor. You'll notice that as a reflux ring where you can actually see vapor condensing on the walls of the test tube and falling back down. The bulb of the thermometer should be fully immersed in that vapor. And you'll notice the temperature change on the thermometer. We need to give the thermometer enough time to fully reach equilibrium, and then we'll record the highest observed temperature. This can take a while because the thermometer is sometimes slow to respond. So what you'll need to do is boil it for a good long time until the temperature tops out on the thermometer. Then record that temperature as the boiling point. You should stop the test if you notice the liquid decomposing, and that would be it turning black or giving off smoke or popping or any of those kinds of features. Or it appears that the sample is about to dry out. If you boil the solute hard enough and the vapor escapes out of the test tube, this might happen. Next, I'll talk about preparing a sample for proton NMR analysis. You'll be given a glass NMR tube with a plastic cap, and you'll use a syringe and needle provided to measure out 0.6 milliliters of CDCL3 solvent. Here's what that would look like and add that to the NMR tube. The use of deuterated solvents for NMR was described in a previous video. Then add one drop of your unknown liquid solute sample, or if you have a solid, measure out about 10 milligrams of your solid sample and add that to the NMR tube. With solid samples, it might be difficult to get a solid into the NMR tube directly, and you might have better luck adding the 10 milligrams of solid to a test tube, and then adding the NMR solvent to the test tube, and then pipetting it from the test tube into the NMR tube. Next, you'll want to cap the tube lightly with a plastic cap and invert it a few times to mix up the solute and the CDCL3. Then, sign up on the sign-up sheet with your name and initials, and finally, write your initials on the top of the NMR tube in a Sharpie marker. And the NMR data will be acquired and emailed to you. 
Here's some safety concerns for today's experiment. First of all, we're going to be working with unknowns and you should treat all unknown chemicals as if they were hazardous. Assume that they're toxic, that they're flammable, that they're corrosive, all of those things. Avoid skin contact, so wear gloves, and avoid breathing their vapors. Dichloromethane is a solvent that many people will have and it's toxic and volatile, so you should wear gloves and avoid breathing the fumes. Ether and THF are also volatile, but they're flammable too, so you should be careful with those to avoid ignition sources. This is the end of the pre-lab section for period one of this experiment. Stay tuned for the next video in the series where I'll actually go through these procedures for a representative unknown solution. If you found this video useful, check out the next one in the series or watch the prior video, and consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. My name is Brant Kudrowski, thanks for watching.